Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to introduce an approach to meta-ethics that's sometimes labelled relaxed realism. Uh, it's defended most famously by Derek Parfit, Thomas Scanlon and Ronald Dawkin. Uh, now, I should say right from the start that this view is tricky to characterise. So it's sometimes called relaxed realism, it's also been called non-metaphysical cognitivism or non-realist cognitivism, so Relaxed realism, non-realist cognitivism, is it realist or non-realist? I mean, that depends on what you mean by realist. But uh, defenders of this view do affirm that there are uh, moral truths, right? So moral judgments express beliefs, some of those beliefs are true, and these truths are discovered. They're not invented or constructed by us. In this, re in this respect, the view is realist. So uh, let's sort of outline the, the basic idea of relaxed realism in a bit more detail. So... Okay, uh, basically the relaxed realist makes four claims. First of all, moral judgments are beliefs. Uh, the alternative here is non-cognitivism. Uh, second, some of these beliefs are true. Uh, there are moral truths. The alternative here is error theory. Third, the moral truths are irreducibly normative. Um, this rules out naturalism and relativism, views like that, which try to show that moral truths can be cashed out in terms of uh, well, in terms of natural properties. Um, I have videos examining all of these alternative views, so I'm not going to go into any detail here. Um, but, you know, so far, all of this is fairly standard, right? So these first three claims are basically just the claims of traditional moral non-naturalism, or robust realism, right? There are moral truths that are independent of us, that are irreducibly normative. Um, when we engage in moral theorizing, we discover these irreducibly normative moral moral truths. Now the, now the relaxed realist adds a fourth claim, which distinguishes her view from ro robust realism. The, re the relaxed realist says that there is nothing that makes the moral truths true. Um, the moral truths are truths without truth makers. So these moral truths do not have any ontological or metaphysical implications. Now, this might sound rather strange. The moral truths are true, but nothing makes them true. Um, so, I mean, perhaps the best way to understand what's going on here is to contrast this view with robust realism. So again, according to robust realism, um, you know, the, these first three claims, the, the robust realist endorses these first three claims, right? So moral judgments are beliefs, some of them are true, and the truths are irreducibly normative. Now, the robust realist will say, that the moral truths are made true by objective moral properties. So these moral properties are, you know, they're part of the world, right? There are moral facts, moral properties that are part of the furniture of reality. Um, so stabbing Frank in the hand with a knife would cause him extreme agony. Uh, almost all realists are going to say that this fact is a reason to refrain from stabbing Frank in the hand. Um, it counts in favour of refraining from stabbing Frank in the hand. On the robust realist view, this reason is a is a property in the world. It's not a natural property, it's not the sort of property that is studied by the sciences, but it exists. Um, so reasons for action, these are, you know, genuine properties out there. They can't be observed or detected with scientific instruments, they don't have causal powers. I mean, I can observe that stabbing causes pain, or at least I can observe the causal effects of pain on people's behaviour. Maybe if I use something like an fMRI machine, I could observe the changing brain states associated with being stabbed. But no matter how many stabbings I observe, no matter how many instruments I use, I'm never going to uh, detect the wrongness of stabbing. I'm never going to detect the fact that the pain caused by stabbing is a reason to refrain from stabbing. So reasons for action are a different kind of property. They're a non-natural property uh, outside the purview of empirical science. Um, now, of course, this distinction between natural and non-natural properties is controversial. Different philosophers draw the line in different ways. Um, but the basic idea is that the natural properties are those properties that can be, you know, detected perceptually or that are postulated in empirical science. Um, natural properties are those properties that figure in our best explanations of the world. Um, moral properties don't seem to play this sort of role. Um, so 
So for the, for the robust realist, there are moral truths, and what makes these moral truths true is, is the non-natural moral properties. Okay, again, I mean, I have videos on moral non-naturalism, so if you want more detail, you can check those out. But, but this should all be, you know, familiar to people who are, you know, aware of meta-ethics. Um, now, the trouble with this sort of picture is that it's kind of hard to square with our modern scientific worldview. Um, what exactly could these irreducibly normative moral properties be? As J.L. Mackey famously put it, if there were such objective properties, they would be entities or qualities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. Um, so an action such as stabbing Frank's hand has a kind of not to be doneness somehow built into it but like how like where does that come from what i mean what even is that seems very odd moreover if there were such objective moral properties how could we know about them um the robust realist herself grants that such properties do not have any causal powers so you know our usual means for gaining knowledge about the world seem to be powerless in this context um again th these are you know, familiar objections. Okay, so the relaxed realist uh, agrees that, m you know, moral moral truths are irreducibly normative. Um, she says that moral truths do not reduce to natural properties. Uh, so that's what we mean by irreducibly normative, right? Uh, moral truths are not made true by the natural facts. So traditionally, this is thought to leave us with two options. We could say, with the error theorists like Mackey, we could say, oh, there are no moral properties, therefore there are no moral truths. All moral judgments are false because they presuppose a realm of these strange moral properties, but there are no such moral properties. The other option is to embrace robust realism. Um, so we say there are moral properties, they're not made true by nat so like there are moral truths. The moral truths are not made true by natural properties. So there must be these irreducibly normative, irreducible moral properties, right? Fundamentally different from the sorts of properties revealed by empirical science. And then we face the task of giving an adequate metaphysical and epistemological account of such properties. So what the relaxed realist is going to try to do is find a sort of middle path between these two these two options. Um, and so with that said, the distinctive claim of relaxed realism is that although some moral judgments are true, nothing makes them true. The moral truths need not be made true by anything in reality. So moral truths, they're not made true by natural properties, but neither are they made true by non-natural properties. They're not made true by anything. Uh, relaxed realists therefore reject the idea that, that truths must correspond to reality. They reject the idea that for, you know, for a proposition to be true is for that proposition to match some independently existing objects or entities. Um, or as Derek Parfit puts it, this is the idea that um, all truths are made true by the way in which they correctly describe how things are in some part of reality. No, says Parfit. Some propositions are true, but there are no objects or properties or relations or anything in the world that makes those propositions true. Um, so in this respect, there's a significant difference between moral truths and truths concerning concrete objects like hands and fields and trees and particles and galaxies. If we postulate these sorts of concrete entities, then we need to show that they have causal powers, that they figure in our best explanations of what we perceive. Um, and, I mean, this is because we take it that our beliefs about these sorts of concrete entities are caused by the independent existence of those entities in the physical world. Like, why do I believe that I have two hands? Well, at least part of the explanation is that, like, there really are two objects in the world that are interacting with my perceptual systems in a particular way, and, you know, that's that's causing, you know, changes in my brain that produce this belief. Um, so, like, light is reflected off these two objects. The light causes a pattern of activation on my retina. That information is sent to the brain, and then I recognize these two objects as hands, and then I form the belief I have two hands. 
Um, and a similar kind of story can be told for most other concrete objects in that we can we can trace a causal chain from the object to our belief about the object. This is not the case for moral truths. Um, now, of course, the moral truths are about things in that occur in the spatio-temporal world. So the proposition slavery is wrong is about slavery, which is, you know, an action um, that humans do. Uh, if, if it's true that slavery is wrong, then that must be true partly in virtue of the properties of slavery. Um, it must be true partly in virtue of, of what is involved in the action of enslaving people. But the key point is that the wrongness of slavery does not exist spatio-temporally. It's not that wrongness inheres within the action of slavery in the way that greenness is a property of an apple, say. So, okay, yeah, moral, there are moral truths, but they're not made true by anything. Does this mean that there are no moral properties, no moral facts? Well, not quite. So, according to Parfit, Talk of moral properties and moral facts is perfectly acceptable, but such talk is, as he puts it, merely pleonastic. So to say that slavery has the property of wrongness is just to say that slavery is wrong. To say that it is a fact that slavery is wrong is just to say that slavery is wrong. Um, so the idea is, is that once we have a moral truth, once we have the truth that slavery is wrong, then talk of moral properties and moral facts comes for free, basically. So it's like, it's true that slavery is wrong. And one way I can put this is to say slavery has the property of wrongness. So instead of saying slavery is wrong, I can, I can say slavery has the property of wrongness. I'm expressing the same thing. Like, all I'm doing is, you know, predicating wrongness of slavery. I'm not committing myself to the existence of some special non-natural property in the world or indeed some special natural property. I'm not committing myself to the existence of some property in the world at all. Um, okay, so this is why moral truths have no ontological implications. We can believe that there are moral truths without this committing us to any particular metaphysics or ontology. Um, and this also means that moral truths are not going to be vulnerable to the kinds of metaphysical and epistemological objections that I raised earlier. If moral truths were made true by properties in the world, we could legitimately wonder what exactly these properties are and how exactly we're capable of accessing such properties. But moral truths are not dependent on such properties. So these problems, they don't arise. So it's a consequence of relaxed realism that moral beliefs cannot be undermined by appealing to non-moral considerations. Uh, if you want to show that a given moral belief is false, you have to appeal directly to moral arguments, not to metaphysics or epistemology. Uh, it's worth getting, pausing a, a little bit to think about why, why this is. So consider what exactly it would mean to deny the truth of a moral proposition. Let's take a proposition like abortion is wrong. Okay, so the, so you want to deny that this is true. Now, there are two ways that you might deny this claim. The first way is you could present moral arguments. You could engage in first order moral theorizing. You might present something like Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist argument, or you might argue that only persons have a right to life and the fetus does not have properties sufficient to be a person. When you present such arguments, you are speaking from within the moral point of view. So, you know, it's like, okay, you're, you're sort of saying, no, abortion isn't wrong, it's permissible. Um, you're making a moral claim. So when you deny that abortion is wrong, in this fashion, you are making a moral claim. You're asserting an alternative moral position. Okay, a second way to approach it is you can detach from the moral point of view. You might deny that this proposition is true by arguing that there is no such thing as wrongness or that we have no reliable way of accessing the facts about wrongness or something like that. And this would be the approach of, you know, a moral error theorist. The moral error theorist questions the existence of the sorts of things required to make this proposition true, but they're not presenting an alternative moral claim. So when the error theorist says that, it is false that abortion is wrong. 
they're not presenting the alternative moral claim that therefore abortion is permissible. They're stepping outside of morality and they're trying to, basically, they're making an assessment of morality as a whole and they're saying the whole thing, you know, falls apart. The whole thing is false. It's an illusion. That's the sort of thing that they're doing. Stepping outside of the moral point of view and trying to undermine morality by appealing to metaphysics or epistemology. But now suppose that the relaxed realist is right and that moral truths do not have truth makers. No ontological entities are required to make moral propositions true. There is no way that reality must be for the proposition to be true. Well, in that case, there's only one way to deny the truth of abortion is wrong, and that is the first way. That is to engage in first order moral theorising. The question of whether or not there really are moral properties or, you know, how we could access such properties or whatever, that has no bearing whatsoever on the question. Um, it's just irrelevant to the assessment of moral propositions. The only way that you can deny that abortion is wrong is to present an alternative moral view and to make a moral argument for that view. So, um, so yeah, this is, this is why you're not going to undermine um, moral beliefs by appealing to metaphysics or epistemology. Now, I suppose one worry about this is that we might still, like, be kind of undermining moral beliefs in a different sense in that it, this might lead to a kind of relativism. So think about the kind of relativist who says that abortion is wrong is true for me, but not for you, or that abortion is wrong is true relative to some societies, but not to others. You know, it's true relative to, you know, the United Kingdom, but it's not true relative to the society in the southern US or something like that. Um, in, you know, like, in some sense, we decide what the moral truths are. The moral truths are invented, not discovered. Now, if you're a, a robust realist, you have a pretty straightforward answer to the relativist. You can say, well, look, there are independent moral properties to which the moral judgments of any person or society can correspond or fail to correspond. So, you know, one reason why we might want to postulate moral properties is to capture the idea that moral truths are something we discover. It's like they're out there and we can be right or wrong about them. Um, and so these independent moral properties are the things that we are matching or failing to match. So when somebody in a different culture says that abortion is wrong, I can say, well, no, you know, because of these, these you're, you're, you're incorrect about the objective moral properties. The relaxed realist denies such objective moral properties. Um, but even so, she will argue that she has the resources to resist relativism. Um, so, I mean, again, the idea is, well, look, there are moral truths, but nothing makes them true. So this means that just as they are not made true by independent moral properties, either natural or non-natural, so they are not made true by the attitudes or values of human beings. So the mere fact that a particular society happens to value the life of a fetus, say, that's not going to make it true that abortion is wrong relative to that society. Again, if we want to know whether or not abortion is wrong, we just have to engage in the first order moral theorising. We can't step outside of the moral domain and assess morality as a whole. We just have to, we have to do morality. We have to make moral arguments. So, you know, suppose, for instance, that we say that abortion is wrong and that it's wrong because it involves depriving a being of a future like ours. The fetus, if left to develop naturally, would develop an, or an ordinary human life and all of the goods that such a life involves. Killing it would deprive it of this, and that's why it's wrong. Let's say we make that argument. Well, if this argument is right, then it's going to be true regardless of what society we're talking about. Abortion in the, U in the United States deprives the fetus of a future like ours, and abortion in India deprives the fetus of a future like ours, and abortion in the UK deprives the fetus of a future like ours. So such an argument, if successful, would show that the wrongness of abortion is not relative to different cultures. Uh, and then the question is just, well, is that argument successful, right? Does abortion deprive the fetus of a future like ours? Is it permissible to deprive a being of a future like ours? And now we're just engaging in a first order moral debate. To assess that, we just have to look at the practical ethics literature on abortion. Um, so the, you know, the truth of a moral proposition and whether that truth is relative or universal can be determined only by appealing to 
moral arguments. The relativist in metaethics, just like the error theorist, tries to step outside of the moral perspective and, you know, find something to which moral truths might correspond. Um, you know, so that for the relativist, it's like the moral truths are made true by our values and attitudes. But that's exactly the sort of move that the relaxed realist says is illegitimate because they're not made true by anything. OK, then, um, a quick advert. I, uh, I have a Patreon. Uh, if you sign up to that on um, on one of the tiers, you will find that there are bonus videos available. Uh, I also have a PayPal, which you can donate to if you want to give a one-off donation. Um, I offer private tutoring in philosophy, uh, and I am qualified to do that. I have a uh, degree, a master's, and a PhD, so um, that's my background. And I have a Discord. The link to all of this will be in the description. Right then, well... You know, look, this is this is relaxed realism. Um, now, there's an obvious concern about everything I've been saying so far, which is just like, what the hell? How could there be truths that are not made true by anything? We might well worry that the relaxed realist has simply traded one mystery for another. So robust realists postulate mysterious moral properties that are unlike anything else in our ontology. Relaxed realists postulate mysterious moral truths that seem to float free from the world, that are unlike any of the other truths we believe. Um, and yet, we can still be, you know, like, we still discover them. They're not, they're not just up to us, you know, we discover these truths. We can be right or wrong about them, and yet nothing makes them true. It's a bit odd. Um, so, in that case, we might think, okay, but what, like, what's the motivation for preferring relaxed realism over robust realism? The objection to robust realism is that it postulates these metaphysically queer moral properties. But now the relaxed realist is postulating a metaphysically queer truth property. Um, so, it doesn't seem like we've made much... You know, we've just, we've just shifted the mystery from one place to another, is the worry. Now, at this point... Um, Parfit argues, he, he sort of pursues a companions in guilt strategy. He, he tries to, he, he argues that morality is not the only domain in which we should recognise truths without truth makers. And he draws analogies to mathematics and modality. All right, then, consider mathematics. Um, there are many mathematical truths, like 1 plus 1 equals 2, or there are prime numbers greater than 100. These are necessarily true. They could not have been false. No matter how we imagine changing the world, it couldn't be the case that 1 plus 1 equals anything other than 2. Now, many of the objections that have been made against moral truths could also be raised against mathematical truths. So, you know, what exactly are numbers? Well, they're abstract objects which have no causal powers, do not exist in space and time. I mean, obviously we can say that in some sense a number is instantiated, because I can say, look, I have two hands. You know, here's one hand, here's another hand. Two. Two hands. But obviously, two hands, that's not the number two in itself. So we're asking, like, what is the number two in itself? Um, and, you know, this is supposed to be like an, an abstract object non-spatiotemporal, non-causal. These sorts of abstract objects seem very strange. And if there are these abstract objects, there is an epistemic challenge. How on earth could we have any access to them? If a statement like there are prime numbers greater than 100 is made true by the relations between abstract objects that exist in a non-spatiotemporal realm, we seem to be cut off from knowledge of the mathematical facts. Nevertheless, there are mathematical truths, and we have knowledge of them. So what Parfit wants to say is there are no numbers in the sense of abstract objects existing in some non-spatiotemporal realm. Mathematical truths are not made true by such things. They're not made true by anything in the world. So as he puts it, these abstract entities have no ontological status. They are not, in the relevant senses, either actual or merely possible, or either real or unreal. When we are trying to form true beliefs about numbers or logical truths, we need not answer ontological questions. So, are there prime numbers greater than 100? Well, to answer this, we just need to do some mathematics. And you can give a pretty straightforward proof that, you know, 101 is a prime number, and obviously 101 is greater than 100, so this shows that, yes, indeed, there are prime numbers greater than 100. Um, 
to ask some metaphysical question about the status of ab abstract objects, well, that has absolutely no relevance to this at all. Um, so are there prime numbers greater than 100? Well, we can easily say yes. Yes, that is true. We can show that it's true. We don't need to do metaphysics. Um, Puffett also draws an analogy to modality. Modality concerns what is necessary, possible, contingent. You know, there are some things that could have happened, but did not actually happen. There are some things that must have happened. Some things must have been the way they are. So, so think about a claim like, there could have been a mountain made of gold. Presumably this is true. Um, what makes it true? Well, many philosophers will propose that there are entities to which this truth must correspond, possible objects in possible worlds. Um, and yeah, so I have some videos, incidentally, on this. Uh, so see, my, I have a series on modal realism. Um, and so some philosophers, you know, a, a, a few, a few, it's a minority position, a few philosophers will propose that possible worlds, you know, really exist. They are concrete objects in just the way that the, uh, you know, in just the way that the actual world exists. Um, or we might think of possible worlds, again, as sort of abstract entities, or maybe they're sets of propositions or something like that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, whatever we say about this, it's going to raise metaphysical and epistemological challenges um, because it doesn't seem like I could have, like, you know, I don't have any interaction with or access to these possible worlds. I mean, I know that there could have been a golden mountain. I'm even able to work out quite specific properties of the golden mountain. So I can work out, you know, like, we, we would be able to work out, for instance, that a golden mountain as large as Everest would have a particular mass, and you could work that out based on the properties of gold. Um, but when you make these sorts of judgments, you're not entering into a, you know, causal relationship with the possible golden mountain. It's not like there's the possible golden mountain there and you're, you know, you're like cutting bits out of it and weighing them and so on. Um, that it's not that there is some entity, the possible golden mountain, that is the object of the study. Um, so again, Parfit says, there are modal truths. It's true that there could have been a mountain made of gold, but nothing makes them true. Um, there are various ways the world could have been, but there are no entities or objects that are ways the world could have been. There's just the actual world and various truths about how it could have been or must have been. Um, so morality is not in a class all of its own. Even if nothing had existed, there would, it would still be true that there are prime numbers greater than 100. Similarly, even if nothing had existed, it would still be true that a world containing only happy people is better than a world containing only miserable people. Um, just as I could have refrained from stealing the cookies, but I stole the cookies anyway, so I should have refrained from stealing the cookies but I stole the cookies anyway. These things are all true. You know, there are ways things could have been and ways things should have been, but these ways things could have been and ways things should have been are not entities or objects in the world. So these things are true, but nothing makes them true. Okay, there are a couple of worries about this analogy. Um, so let's have a look at some of these objections. Um, so first of all, Th th this doesn't really do much to illuminate the idea of truths without truth makers, right? So if we thought that this idea was mysterious with respect to moral truths, then saying that, well, it also holds in the domain of mathematics and modality only seems to spread the mystery around. Um, we wanted to understand, well, you know, how could there be a truth without anything that makes it true? How do we make sense of this? Merely being told that there are other domains beyond morality in which there are such truths doesn't really seem to help here. Um, I mean, it certainly doesn't seem to make it uh, any less metaphysically mysterious, right? Like this was this was the, the initial worry that the relaxed realist is merely trading one mystery for another and uh, arguably this analogy doesn't really help much. Um, okay, a second concern is that the status of both mathematical truths and modal truths are disputed. Um, so the idea that these are truth, you know, that there are truths in this domain but nothing makes them true doesn't seem to be particularly popular with respect to either domain. Um, so, you know, rather than supporting relaxed realism about morality, we might think that the analogy to mathematical and modal domains only illustrates the implausibility of relaxed realism. Um, I mean, most philosophers who 
uh, who think that there are mathematical truths will postulate, you know, they might postulate platonic abstract objects or they might postulate structures of some sort. Um, there are some philosophers who are mathematical fictionalists. I mean, you see, you see the same thing with respect to the metaphysics of modality, right? You know, there's a few philosophers who postulate concretely existing possible worlds. Others postulate abstract uh, possible worlds. Others think that possible worlds talk is a kind of fiction, etc., etc. Um, so, you know, it's. I mean, I mean, in that case, you might think, well, this isn't really a very plausible kind of companions in guilt with respect to the idea of truths without truth makers, because the idea that mathematical truths are without truth makers or that modal truths are without truth makers is just as controversial as the idea that moral truths are without truth makers. Uh, a third worry is raised by Sarah McGrath in her article, Relax, Don't Do It. Um, so, uh, McGrath points out that mathematics appears to play a very significant role in the empirical sciences. In fact, one of the standard arguments for the idea that there are mathematical truths is the quine putnam indispensability argument, which goes basically as follows. Um, it says, we ought to believe in whatever entities play an indispensable role in our best empirical theories. Mathematical entities play an indispensable role in our best empirical theories, so we ought to believe in mathematical entities. It's basically just a kind of inference to the best explanation, um, you know, where it's like, well, we, we believe our best scientific theories and part of what it is to believe those theories is to believe whatever those theories are, you know, whatever entities they quantify over. Um, and indeed, you know, those theories will, will postulate mathematical entities like numbers and sets. Um, so I talk about this in my video on mathematical Platonism. Um, but the point is, is, you know, uh, we, we're appealing to the incredible success of mathematics within the sciences um, to defend the idea that there are mathematical truths. There are, of course, plenty of objections to this sort of argument, but the point to notice for our purposes is that there seems to be a disanalogy between mathematics and morality here, because actually mathematical facts do figure in our best explanations of empirical phenomena. So, you know, why do we believe that there are mathematical truths? Part of the answer might be to do with the role that mathematics plays in empirical theorizing. And the same point can be made for modality, because our best scientific theories will appeal to counterfactual scenarios. Scientists regularly idealize, you know, they will, uh, they will postulate models that you know, have ideal gases, frictionless planes, infinite populations, oceans with infinite depth, and so on. Um, and this seems to involve counterfactual reasoning, right? You're reasoning about alternative possibilities. So we could give a similar indispensability argument for modal truths, um, along the same lines as the Quine-Putnam argument for mathematical realism. Um, again, plenty of objections to such an argument. The point is just there may not be such a strong analogy between mathematics and modality on the one hand and morality on the other as the relaxed realist requires. For the relaxed realist, moral truths are supposed to be fundamentally different from the sorts of properties that are studied in the empirical sciences. Um, I mean, this is where the relaxed realist departs from naturalism. Um, so truths without truth makers, these, these moral truths without truth makers, they're, they're, they are of a different class. Um, there are truth makers for the truths unveiled by the sciences, namely the objects and events in the concrete physical world. Um, but, you know, it, okay, it turns out that actually scientific theories, prima facie, quantify over mathematical and modal properties. Um, so, you know, if if the moral truths are in fact fundamentally different from these sorts of truth, from these other truths, um, then, yeah, I mean, the fact that the the... I mean, basically, it suggests, perhaps, that the prospects for sort of naturalising mathematics, naturalising modality, are brighter than for naturalising morality. In any case, there is a, uh, a relevant disanalogy between these domains. <clears throat> okay, so, the idea, then, the idea that there are moral truths, but that nothing makes them true, is puzzling. Um, now, of course, the mere fact that something is puzzling is perhaps not really an objection, um, but I'm going to pronounce this name incorrectly, Jossi Sukarnen in the article Non-Realist Cognitivism, Truth and Objectivity, um, examines the relaxed realist account of truth in more detail and 
he argues that there really is no um there is no theory of truth there is no account of truth that is going to be suitable for a relaxed realist um so if we if we claim that there are moral truths but that nothing makes them true this of course invites the question well what exactly is the difference between the true moral propositions and the false ones um, and Sukunen in explores this by asking what theory of truth is available to the relaxed realist. I'm currently doing a video series on different theories of truth, um, so uh, yeah, I'll link some of those videos in the comments. Um, anyway, the standard theory of truth, most popular theory, is uh, the correspondence theory. According to correspondence theory, P is true just in case P corresponds to, or matches, some state of affairs in the world. So the cat is on the mat is true just in case there is an object picked out by the term cat, an object picked out by the term mat, and those objects are related in the way that the proposition describes. Now clearly the relaxed realist cannot accept correspondence theory, at least not with respect to moral truths. Uh, so, you know, it's true that slavery is wrong. Slavery picks out something in the world, but wrongness does not. The truth that slavery is wrong does not correspond to anything any natural property or non-natural property. So, correspondence theory is off the table for the relaxed realist. Well, another very popular approach to truth is uh, the deflationary theory. Deflationary, there are, there are a bunch of different versions of deflationism, but the basic idea of deflationism is that truth is not a, it's not a genuine property, it's not a substantive property, not an explanatory property. There's different ways of putting it, but basically the thought is, look, um, to say that P is true, is equivalent to just saying P. So the essence of truth is what's sometimes known as the equivalence schema. The proposition P is true if and only if P, right? So if P is true, then P, and if P, then P is true. That is the essence of truth. Um, and the truth predicate plays an important linguistic role. For example, when you say something that I agree with, I can express my agreement by just saying, that's true, rather than repeating what you said. But all I'm doing when I say that P is true is just reasserting P, okay? So it's not that, yeah, so, I mean, there is no substantive property of truth. That's just that, like, the truth predicate plays this important linguistic role, um, and that's it. Now, initially, deflationism about truth might seem to be more suited to relaxed realism, but it runs into a problem. Um... The relaxed realist agrees that moral properties are such that they, you know, they would be a genuine part of reality if they existed. I mean, that's how the relaxed realist distinguishes her position from robust realism. Like, the, the robust realist postulates these metaphysical moral facts. The relaxed realist denies that there are such facts. Um, you know, some moral propositions are still true, but they're true in the deflationary way. Um... Now, the, the trouble is, is that this is, is that if you accept a kind of deflationism about truth and you use this to account for how there can be moral truths, is that it's now unclear how relaxed realism is anything more than a merely verbal variant of error theory. So here's the problem. According to moral error theorists, moral judgments express beliefs, so they're truth apt, but there are no moral properties. And so the error theorist says all moral judgments are false. But the reason why the error theorist draws the conclusion that all moral judgments are false is because they're assuming a correspondence theory of truth. If instead we were to combine error theory with a deflationary theory of truth, like let's say let's say we just adopt a deflationary theory for the sake of argument, right? Well, in that case, it seems like even the error theorist would say that there are actually moral truths. And this is because error theorists generally continue to use moral discourse. I mean, there are a few error theorists who favour eliminating moral discourse. These are the moral abolitionists, but that's very much a minority position. Most error theorists continue to make moral judgments, but they view morality as a kind of useful fiction. So the error theorist will say, for instance, that slavery is wrong, and she will view this judgment as a useful falsehood. Um, you know, maybe it's a, just a sort of tool for expressing her desires, expressing a, a, a way that she wants the world to be, or something like that. Um, so, but the point is, the error theorist 
continues to say, she continues to think and to say sentences like slavery is wrong. She continues to, you know, make the judgment that slavery is wrong. And she thinks that's fine. She thinks it's perfectly appropriate, right? There are, you know, that, that, that she, she would say, yeah, you know, there are, there's perfectly good reason to continue making this judgment. It's perfectly appropriate to continue making this judgment and she will defend that claim. Um, so, you know, just look at, for instance, uh, the work of someone like Richard Joyce. Richard Joyce is an error theorist, but he's, uh, he, he gives a defense of continuing to make moral judgments as a kind of useful fiction. So, so the error theorist continues to think and to say sentences like slavery is wrong. But if we then adopt a deflationary theory of truth, it looks like, well, in that case, the error theorist is going to say that, yeah, I mean, in that sense, in, in the deflationary sense, sure, slavery is wrong is true. If, if P is true just means P, you know, if, if, if all I'm doing when I say that P is true is just, you know, reasserting P, then, okay, uh, well, given that I'm, I think it's perfectly appropriate to judge that slavery is wrong, I'm going to think it's perfectly appropriate to judge that it is true that slavery is wrong. Um, so the situation is this. Relaxed realists and error theorists agree that moral judgments express beliefs. They agree that there are no moral properties in, in reality. There's no moral properties out there in the world. And so they agree that moral judgments are not made true by such moral properties. They agree that moral judgments are not made true by anything. Um, but they both continue to make moral judgments. So the, the difference here, the only difference, it seems, is that the you know, relaxed realists will say, well, some of these moral judgments are true. Whereas the error theorist will say, all moral judgments are false, but some of them are useful falsehoods. But if we adopt a deflationary theory of truth, it's not clear how we can make this distinction anymore. Because on a deflationary theory of truth, to say that a moral judgment is true is to do nothing more than to just make that moral judgment. So the relaxed realist and the error theorists can agree that a moral judgment is true in the deflationary sense. They both deny that it's true in the sense of corresponding with reality. Um, so now it's just, so, so the, the worry is, okay, it's unclear now what the distinction is supposed to be between the relaxed realist and the error theorist, or at least the error theorist who continues to use moral discourse. Um, so this is basically the problem, right? Like, uh, relaxed realists want to be saying something different to error theory, um, but the distinction starts to look like a merely verbal distinction. Like, the relaxed realist just happens to like using the word true. Um, yeah, the error theorist doesn't. Um, now, there are, of course, various other theories of truth. Uh, I'll just briefly mention two other options, coherence theory and pragmatism. So according to coherence theory, a proposition is true just in case it's a member of a coherent set of beliefs. According to pragmatism, a proposition is true just in case it is useful in the long run. Um... That is, just in case it would be accepted at the end of inquiry, were inquiry to continue as long as possible. Um, there's much more to say about these two views, and I have videos that explore them both in more detail. Um, but uh, but neither of these, Sukhanin says, is uh, going gonna, gonna to be well suited to relaxed realism. I mean, one problem here is just that they, they make the moral truths dependent on the beliefs and interests of people. So they may be committed to a kind of relativism that the relaxed realist would prefer to avoid. More importantly, um, on these views, it looks like the moral truths are actually being made true by something else. So, you know, it looks like they're made true by their relationship to our other beliefs, or they're made true by the role that they play in our practices or whatever. Um, so that would no longer be relaxed realism. Um, so yeah, the, the objection then is that there is no theory of truth that can that can make sense of what the relaxed realist is trying to do. Okay then, here's a final objection. This is raised by Tristram McPherson in his article Against Quietist Normative Realism. Um, moral norms are supposed to have a kind of authority over our deliberations, and this gives rise to the following question. What makes one purported moral standard authoritative while another is not. McPherson draws an analogy to chess. In chess, it is against the rules to move one's knight diagonally like a bishop. Moving the knight diagonally is incorrect relative to the rules of chess. Now we can consider a different game, Schmess. 
In Schmess, it is legal to move the knight diagonally. Moving the knight diagonally is permissible relative to the rules of Schmess. In both games, moving the knight along the rank or file is illegal. Now, suppose we are playing a game of chess, and I ask, is it acceptable for me to move my knight diagonally? Well, no. But this is only because we've chosen to play a game of chess. Had we chosen to play Schmess instead, it would have been perfectly fine for me to move the knight diagonally. And in this sense, the rules of chess do not have any authority over us. The same is not true for moral rules. We can't simply opt out of playing the moral game, as it were, in the way that we can opt out of playing the game of chess. But just as there are different, um, you know, the, we, we have these, these uh, different chess-like games, um, such as such as Schmess, um, you can similarly find different, you know, different normative systems. Kind of, there's like the moral system, and then there are various other kind of moral-like systems. So, stabbing Frank in the hand would violate a moral standard, at least in normal circumstances. You have a reason not to stab Frank in the hand, but consider an alternative normative framework, the disutilitarian normative framework. According to this framework, the disutilitarian, the disutilitarian standard says maximise suffering, maximise pain. So, according to this framework, you have a schmeason to do A, just in case doing A will increase suffering. So although you have a reason not to stab Frank in the hand, you have a schmeason to stab Frank in the hand. Um, <coughs> so m m moral reasons are, um, yeah, they're, they're supposed to be authoritative in a way that chess and schmess and schmeasons are not. Now, the robust realist offers at least a sketch of an explanation for the distinctive authority of moral reasons. What makes moral reasons special is that they correspond to these objective, non-natural properties. Obviously, the relaxed realist can't say this. So, the challenge is to distinguish authoritative normativity from, you know, the merely sort of formal normativity that, that any rule-based system will have. Um, and there are three conditions on a successful relaxed realist explanation, according to Macpherson. So, first of all, um, the moral norms need to be shown to have some feature F that explains their, their authority over us. Um, second, F must not be shared with any alternative normative system, like the disutilitarian Schmeisen's standard. And third, F cannot be cashed out in metaphysical terms. We're not you know, we're not proposing some metaphysical grounding of morality because that would be to abandon relaxed realism for robust realism. So F has to be internal to the moral system. Um, recall the relaxed realist's argument that a moral belief can only be justified or undermined by giving moral considerations, by reasoning within the moral framework. So F must be found within the moral framework itself. It can't be some external property to which that framework corresponds. Now, the trouble is, this looks like a very high bar to meet. Um, we, we need to find some asymmetry between moral reasons and disutilitarian schmeasons. This must be based on a feature of the moral standard that is not shared with other standards like the disutilitarian schmeasons standard, and that is internal to the moral standard. The worry is, is that for anything that we take to be internal to the moral standard, it seems like we're going to be able to find a parallel in in other standards, like the Schmeisen's standard. For example, we might say that the authority of the moral standard arises from the fact that we can make mistakes with respect to this standard. Relative to the moral standard, it would be a mistake to say that, you know, the fact that stabbing Frank in the hand causes pain is a reason to stab Frank in the hand. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's totally true. Obviously, that's, a, that's an error, right? The fact that stabbing Frank in the hand, the fact that this causes pain is a reason to do it, um, no, that's a mistake relative to the moral standard. But then the same can be said for any other standard. So relative to the Schmeisen's standard, it is a mistake to say that the fact that stabbing Frank in the hand causes pain is a reason to refrain from stabbing Frank in the hand. Um, I mean, according to the reason standard, no, the fact that stabbing Frank in the hand causes, causes pain, um, they would take that to, like be a, a reason, or you could even say schmeason, to do it. Um, so, you know, you can similarly find uh, uh, errors relative to to other 
sorts of standards, right? If, if, I, if I say um, the fact that stabbing Frank causes pain is a schmeason not to stab Frank, then that would be an error relative to the schmeason's standard. Um, similarly, relative to the rules of chess, it's a mistake to move one's knight diagonally, etc., etc. So, you know, that... So, so the point is, yeah, I mean, this is just maybe a way of sort of laying down a challenge to the relaxed realist, which is to say, OK, give us an explanation of the authority of morality that meets these three conditions. That's what we need. Um, and that's a, you know, like I said, a tricky bar to meet. But then, you know, maybe, uh, look, sometimes people, uh, philosophers can fulfill these uh, tricky tasks. So maybe this isn't so much a problem, but it is a challenge. Okay, then. Uh, I think that's enough for this video. We will leave it there. I hope that made sense. I've, I think uh, relaxed realism is a, is a tricky one to talk about. I, I, I really tried to make this accessible, but I think there's so much... Um, I, I don't think I succeeded. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I have to say I wasn't happy with this video. You know, I, I, I always, you know, try to make it so that it's it's accessible to, to the sort of educated layperson, as it were, and it's not assuming too much background. But I don't think that this video achieved that. It's um, in order to even kind of put relaxed realism on the table, you sort of have to explain various other meta-ethical views in so much detail, um, which, of course, I didn't do here. Um, and... I suppose also it's just a, it's a new position. It's a relatively new position. It hasn't perhaps been as well worked out as uh, as some of the other options. Um, so I found this one a, a tricky one to write. Anyway, I will leave that there. Bye, everybody.